The Story of the Four Little Children Who Went Round the World by Edward Lear. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Algy Pug. The Story of the Four Little Children Who Went Round the World by Edward Lear. Once upon a time, a long while ago, the four little people whose names were Violet, Slingsby, Guy, and Lionel, and they all thought they should like to see the world. So they bought a large boat to sail quite around the world by sea, and then they were to come back on the other side by land. The boat was painted blue with green spots, and the sail was yellow with red stripes, and when they set off, they only took a small cat to steer and look after the boat, besides an elderly quangle-wangle who had to cook the dinner and make the tea, for which purpose they took a large kettle. For the first ten days they sailed on beautifully, and found plenty to eat, as were lots of fish, and they had only to take them out of the sea with a long spoon, when the quangle-wangle instantly cooked them, and the pussy-cat was fed with the bones, with which she expressed herself pleased on the whole, so that all the party were very happy. During the daytime, Violet chiefly occupied herself in putting salt water into a churn, while her three brothers churned it violently, in the hope that it would turn into butter, which it seldom, if ever, did. And in the evening they all retired into the tea-kettle, where they all managed to sleep very comfortably, while Pussy and the Quangle-Wangle managed the boat. After a time they saw some land at a distance, and when they came to it they found it was an island made of water quite surrounded by earth. Besides that, it was bordered by evanescent isthmuses, with a great gulf stream running about all over it, so that it was perfectly beautiful, and contained only a single tree five hundred and three feet high. When they had landed, they walked about, but found, to their great surprise, that the island was quite full of veal cutlets and chocolate drops, and nothing else. So they all climbed up the single high tree to discover, if possible, if there were any people. But having remained on the top of the tree for a week, and not seeing anybody, they naturally concluded that there were no inhabitants, and accordingly, when they came down, they loaded the boat with two thousand veal cutlets and a million of chocolate drops, and these afforded them sustenance for more than a month, during which time they pursued their voyage with the utmost delight and apathy. After this, they came to a shore where there were no less than sixty-five great red parrots with blue tails, sitting on a rail all of a row, and all fast asleep. And I am sorry to say that the pussy in the quangle-wangle crept softly and bit off the tail-feathers of all the sixty-five parrots, for which Violet reproved them both severely. Notwithstanding which, she proceeded to insert all the feathers, two hundred and sixty in number, in her bonnet, thereby causing it to have a lovely and glittering appearance, highly prepossessing and efficacious. The next thing that happened to them was in a narrow part of the sea, which was so entirely full of fishes that the boat could go on no farther, so they remained there about six weeks, till they had eaten nearly all the fishes, which were soles, and already cooked, and covered with shrimp sauce, so that there was no trouble whatever. And as the few fishes who remained, uneaten, complained of the cold, as well as of the difficulty they had in getting any sleep on account of the extreme noise made by the arctic bears and the tropical turnspits which frequented the neighbourhood in great numbers violet most amiably knitted a small woollen frock for several of the fishes and slingsby administered some opium drops to them through which kindness they became quite warm and slept soundly then they came to a country which was wholly covered with immense orange trees of a vast size and quite full of fruit, so they landed, taking with them the tea-kettle, intending to gather some of the oranges, and place them in it. But while they were busy about this, a most dreadfully high wind arose, and blew out most of the parrot-tail feathers from Violet's bonnet. That, however, was nothing compared with the calamity of the oranges falling down on their heads by millions and millions, which thumped and bumped and bumped and thumped them all so seriously that they were obliged to run as hard as they could for their lives. Besides that, the sound of the oranges rattling on the tea-kettle was of the most fearful and amazing nature. Nevertheless, they got safely to the boat, 
although considerably vexed and hurt, and the Quangle Wangle's right foot was so knocked about that he had to sit with his head in his slipper for at least a week. This event made them all for a time rather melancholy, and perhaps they might never have become less so, had not Lionel, with a most praiseworthy devotion and perseverance, continued to stand on one leg and whistle to them in a loud and lively manner which diverted the whole party so extremely that they gradually recovered their spirits and agreed that whenever they should reach home they were subscribed towards a testimonial to lionel entirely made of gingerbread and raspberries as an earnest token of their sincere and grateful infection after sailing on calmly for several more days they came to another country where they were much pleased and surprised to see a countless multitude of white mice with red eyes all sitting in a great circle slowly eating custard pudding with the most satisfactory and polite demeanour and as the four travellers were rather hungry being tired of eating nothing but soles and oranges for so long a period they held a council as to the propriety of asking the mice for some of their pudding in a humble and affecting manner by which they could hardly be otherwise than gratified it was agreed therefore that guy should go and ask the mice which he immediately did and the result was that they gave him a walnut shell only half full of custard diluted with water now this displeased guy who said out of such a lot of pudding as you have got i must say you might have spared a somewhat larger quantity but no sooner had he finished speaking than the mice turned round at once and sneezed at him in an appalling and vindictive manner and it is impossible to imagine a more scroobious and unpleasant sound than that caused by the simultaneous sneezing of many millions of angry mice so the guy rushed back to the boat having first shied his cap into the middle of the custard pudding by which means he completely spoiled the mice's dinner by and by the four children came to a country where there were no houses but only an incredibly innumerable number of large bottles without cork and of a dazzling and sweetly susceptible blue colour each of these blue bottles contained a blue bottle fly and all these interesting animals lived continually in together in the most copious and rural harmony nor perhaps in many parts of the world is such perfect and abject happiness to be found violet and slingsby and guy and lionel were greatly struck with this singular and instructive settlement and having previously asked permission of the blue bottle flies which was most courteously granted the boat was drawn up to the shore and they proceeded to make tea in front of the bottles but as they had no tea leaves they merely placed some pebbles in the hot water and the quangle wangle played some tunes over it on an accordion by which of course tea was made directly and of the very best quality the four children then entered into conversation with the blue bottle flies who discoursed in a placid and genteel manner though with a slightly buzzing accent chiefly owing to the fact that they each held a small clothes brush between their teeth which naturally occasioned a fizzy, extraneous utterance. Why, said Violet, would you kindly inform us, do you reside in bottles? And if in bottles at all, why not rather in green or purple, or indeed in yellow bottles? To which questions a very aged blue bottle fly answered, We found the bottles here all ready to live in, and it is in, and great, 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 great grandfather's dead so we occupy them all at once and when the wind comes on we turn the bottles upside down and consequently really feel the cold at all and you know very well that this could not be the case with bottles of any other colour than blue of course it could not said slingsby but if we may take the liberty of inquiring on what do you chiefly subsist mainly on oyster patties said the blue bottle fly and when these are scarce on raspberry vinegar and rennet and leather boiled down to a jelly how delicious said guy to which lionel added huzz and all the blue bottle flies said buzz at this time an elderly fly said it was the hour for the evening song to be sung and on the signal being given all the blue bottle flies began to buzz at once in a sumptuous and sonorous manner the melodious and mucilaginous sounds echoing all over the waters and resounding across the tumultuous tops of the transitory titmice upon the intervening and verdant mountains with a serene and sickly suavity only known to the truly virtuous the moon was shining slobaciously from the star-bespangled sky 
while her light irrigated the smooth and shiny sides and wings and backs of the bluebottle flies with a peculiar and trivial splendour while all nature cheerfully responded to the cerulean and conspicuous circumstances in many long after years the four little travellers looked back to that evening as one of the happiest in all their lives and it was already past midnight when the sail of the boat having been set up by the quangle wangle the tea kettle and churn placed in their respective positions and the pussycat stationed at the helm the children each took a last and affectionate farewell of the blue bottle flies who walked down in a body to the water's edge to see the travellers embark as a token of parting respect and esteem violet made a courtesy quite down to the ground and stuck one of her few remaining parrot tail feathers into the back hair of the most pleasing of the blue bottle flies while slingsby guy and lionel offered them three small boxes containing respectively black pins dried figs and epsom salts and thus they left that happy shore for ever overcome by their feelings the four little travellers instantly jumped into the tea kettle and fell fast asleep but all along the shore for many hours there was distinctly heard a sound of severely suppressed sobs and of a vague multitude of living creatures using their pocket handkerchiefs in a subdued simultaneous snuffle lingering sadly along the walloping waves as the boat sailed farther and farther away from the land of the happy blue bottle flies nothing particular occurred for some days after these events except that as the travellers were passing a low tract of land they perceived an unusual and gratifying spectacle namely a large number of crabs and crawfish perhaps six or seven hundred sitting by the water side and endeavouring to disentangle a vast heap of pale pink worsted which they moistened at intervals with a fluid composed of lavender water and white wine negus. "'Can we be of any service to you, O crusty crabbies?' said the four children. "'Thank you kindly,' said the crabs consecutively. "'We are trying to make some worsted mittens, but do not know how.' On which Violet, who was perfectly acquainted with the art of mitten-making, said to the crabs, "'Do your claws unscrew, or are they fixtures?' "'They are all made to unscrew,' said the crabs and forthwith they deposited a great pile of claws close to the boat with which violet uncombed all the pale pink worsted and then made the loveliest mittens with it you can imagine these the crabs having resumed and screwed on their claws placed cheerfully upon their wrists and walked away rapidly on their hind legs warbling songs with a silvery voice and in a minor key after this the four little people sailed on again until they came to a vast and wide plain of astonishing dimensions on which nothing whatever could be discovered at first but as the travellers walked onward there appeared in the extreme and dim distance a single object which on a nearer approach and on an accurately cutaneous inspection seemed to be someone in a large white wig sitting on an armchair made of sponge cakes and oyster shells it does not look like a human being said violet doubtfully nor could they make out what it really was till the quangle wangle who had previously been around the world exclaimed softly in a loud voice it is the cooperative cauliflower and so in truth it was and they soon found out what they had taken for an immense wig was in reality the top of the cauliflower and that he had no feet at all being able to walk tolerably well with a fluctuating and graceful movement on a single cabbage stalk an accomplishment which naturally saved him the expense of stockings and shoes. Presently, while the whole party from the boat was gazing at him with mingled affection and disgust, he suddenly arose, and in a somewhat plumdomphious manner hurried off towards the setting sun, his steps supported by two superincumbent confidential cucumbers, and a large number of water wagtails proceeding in advance of him by three and three in a row till he finally disappeared on the brink of the western sky in a crystal cloud of sudorific sand so remarkable a sight of course impressed the four children very deeply and they returned immediately to their boat with a strong sense of undeveloped asthma and a great appetite shortly after this the travellers were obliged to sail directly below some high overhanging rocks from the top of one of which a particularly odious little boy dressed in rose-coloured knickerbockers and with a pewter plate upon his head threw an enormous pumpkin at the boat by which it was instantly upset but this upsetting was of no consequence 
because all the party knew how to swim very well, and in fact they preferred swimming about until after the moon rose, when, the water growing chilly, they spontaneously entered the boat. Meanwhile, the Quangle Wangle threw back the pumpkin with immense force, so that it hit the rocks where the malicious little boy in rose-coloured knickerbockers was sitting, when, being quite full of lucifer matches, the pumpkin exploded surreptitiously into a thousand bits, whereon the rocks instantly took fire, and the odious little boy became unpleasantly hotter, and hotter, and hotter, till his knickerbockers were turned quite green, and his nose was burnt off. Two or three days after this had happened, they came to another place, where they found nothing at all except some wide and deep pits full of mulberry jam. This was the property of the tiny, yellow-nosed apes who abound in these districts, and who store up the mulberry jam for their food in winter, when they mix it with pellucid, pale periwinkle soup, and serve it out in Wedgwood china bowls, which grow freely over all that part of the country. Only one of the yellow-nosed apes was on the spot, and he was fast asleep. Yet the four travellers, and the quangle-wangle, and pussy, were so terrified by the violence and sanguinary sound of his snoring, they merely took a small cupful of the jam, and returned to re-embark in their boat without delay. What was their horror on seeing the boat, including the churn and the tea-kettle, in the mouth of an enormous sea-spider, an aquatic and ferocious creature truly dreadful to behold, and, happily, only met with in those excessive longitudes. In a moment, the beautiful boat was bitten into fifty-five thousand million hundred billion bits, and it instantly became quite clear that Violet, Slingsby, Guy, and Lionel could no longer preliminate their voyage by sea. The four travellers were therefore obliged to resolve on pursuing their wanderings by land, and very fortunately there happened to pass by at that moment an elderly rhinoceros on which they seized, and all four mounting on his back, the quangle-wangle sitting on his horn and holding on by his ears, and the pussy-cat swinging at the end of his tail, they set off, having only four small beans and three pounds of mashed potatoes to last through their whole journey. They were, however, able to catch numbers of the chickens and turkeys and other birds who incessantly alighted on the head of the rhinoceros for the purpose of gathering the seeds of the rhododendron plants which grew there, and these creatures they cooked in a most translucent and satisfactory manner by means of a fire lighted on the end of the rhinoceros's back. A crowd of kangaroos and gigantic cranes accompanied them from feelings of curiosity and complacency, so that they were never at a loss for company, and went onward, as it were, in a sort of profuse and triumphant procession. Thus, in less than eighteen weeks, they all arrived safely at home, where they were received by their admiring relatives with joy tempered with contempt, and where they finally resolved to carry out the rest of their travelling plans at some more favourable opportunity. As for the rhinoceros, in token of their grateful adherence, they had him killed and stuffed directly, and then set him up outside the door of their father's house as a diaphanous door scraper. End of the story of the four little children who went round the world by Edward Lear. The Nine Lives of a Cat, a Tale of Wonder by Charles Bennett. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Preface This tale of wonder is told for children, with which view it has been carefully designed and very nicely printed. For some time past it has arrived at the dignity of popular nursery tale in the author's family and it is hoped it will merit the same good fortune elsewhere. It will be worth while explaining that the circle in each page is made to represent some object in connection with the story, and that, as some of them have proved rather puzzling, so juvenile admirers has been left the task of finding them out. How many lives has a cat got? Nine. But when she was young, poor Kitty was hung. So how many lives has a cat got? Yes, Kitty was hung when she was young, but as you would hope, she pulled a knife out of her side pocket, and before you could count, one, two, three, cut right through the rope. How many lives has the cat got? Eight, but she was rounder, 
A boy tried to drown her. So how many lives has a cat got? Yes, a boy tried to drown her, went fatter and rounder. But as you would wish, she slipped the stone off her neck, and before you could count, one, two, three, swam like a fish. How many lives has a cat got? Seven. But as I have learned, poor pussy was burned. So how many lives has a cat got? Yes, pussy was burned, as I too have learned. But as you will read, she jumped into the water, but before you could count one, two, three, she did indeed. How many lives has a cat got? Six. But she fell off the house, running after a mouse. So how many lives has a cat got? Yes, she fell off the house, running after a mouse. But as life is sweet, before you could count one, two, three, she came on her feet. How many lives has a cat got? Five. But I hear she has not, for they say she was shot. So how many lives has a cat got? Yes, with a gun she was shot, and a trigger it had got. I saw the man pull it, but Pussy held up her paws like the wizard of the north, and before you could count, one, two, three, caught the bullet. How many lives has the cat got? Four, but people all say she was poisoned one day, so how many lives has the cat got? Yes, it's true, people say she was poisoned one day, and very much it shocked her, but the moment she felt ill, and before you could count one, two, three, she was off to the doctor. So how many lives has the cat got? Three. But when the old wall crushed her in its fall, so how many lives has the cat got? Yes, I know the old wall flattened the puss in its fall, and a dozen of her fellows. But Pussy walked sideways into the kitchen, and before you could count, one, two, three, blew herself out with the bellows. How many lives has a cat got? Two. But hit by a dog, she's dead as a log. So how many lives has a cat got? Yes, bit by a dog, but not dead as a log, as you'll gladly find, for she climbed up the apple tree before you could count, one, two, three, and left the dog behind. How many lives has a cat got? One. But when she's grown old and she has caught a bad cold, so how many lives has a cat got? Yes, she has grown old and has caught a bad cold. Only bread and milk she touches, except a little gruel, but she burns a great deal of fuel, and you may count one, two, three, a great many times, while she hobbles across the room on her crutches. How many lives has the cat got? None. Is it true, then, as they said, that poor old puss is dead? So how many lives has the cat got? Yes, the song has all been said, and the poor old puss is dead. Let it never be forget, although not one, two, three, but nine lives she had got. End of The Nine Lives of a Cat by Charles Bennett. The Three Fishes by Ellen C. Babbitt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Once upon a time, three fishes lived in a faraway river. They were named Thoughtful, Very Thoughtful, and Thoughtless. One day they left the wild country where no men lived, and came down the river to live near a town. Very Thoughtful said to the other two, There is danger all about us here. Fishermen come to the river here to catch fish with all sorts of nets and lines. Let us go back again to the wild country where we used to live. But the other two fishes were so lazy and so greedy that they kept putting off their going from day to day. But one day Thoughtful and Thoughtless went swimming on ahead of Very Thoughtful. And they did not see the fisherman's net and rushed into it. Very Thoughtful saw them rush into the net. I must save them, said Very Thoughtful. 
So swimming around the net, he splashed in the water in front of it, like a fish that had broken through the net and gone up the river. Then he swam back to the net and splashed about there like a fish that had broken through and gone down the river. The fisherman saw the splashing water and thought the fishes had broken through the net and that one had gone up the river, the other down. So he pulled in the net by one corner. That let the two fishes out of the net and away they went to find Very Thoughtful. You saved our lives, Very Thoughtful they said and now we are willing to go back to the wild country so back they all went to their old home where they lived safely ever after end of the three fishes by ellen c babbitt goody two shoes by m loglin this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Goody Two Shoes Farmer Meanwell was at one time a very rich man. He owned large fields and had fine flocks of sheep and plenty of money. But all at once his good fortune seemed to desert him. Year after year his crops failed his sheep died off and he was obliged to borrow money to pay his rent and the wages of those who worked on the farm at last he had to sell his farm but even this did not bring him enough money to pay his debts and he was worse off than ever among those who had lent money to farmer meanwell were sir thomas gripe and a farmer named graspel sir thomas was a very rich man indeed and the farmer Graspel had more money than he could possibly use. But they were both very greedy and covetous, and particularly hard on those who owed them anything. Farmer Graspel abused Farmer Meanwell and called him all sorts of dreadful names. But the rich Sir Thomas Gripe was more cruel still, and wanted the poor debtor shut up in jail. So poor Farmer Meanwell has to hasten from the place where he had lived for so many years in order to get out of the way of these greedy men he went to the next village taking his wife and his two little children with him but though he was free from gripe and graspel he was not free from trouble and care he soon fell ill and when he found himself unable to get food and clothes for his family he grew worse and worse and soon died his wife could not bear the loss of her husband whom she loved so dearly, and in a few days she was dead. The two orphan children seemed to be left entirely alone in this world, with no one to look after them or care for them but their heavenly father. They trotted around hand in hand, and the poorer they became, the more they clung to each other, poor, ragged, and hungry enough they were. Tommy had two shoes, but Marguerite went barefoot. They had nothing to eat but the berries that grew in the woods, and the scraps they could get from the poor people in the village, and at night they slept in barns or under haystacks. Their rich relations were too proud to notice them, but Mr. Smith, the clergyman of the village where the children were born, was not that sort of a man. A rich relation came to visit him, a kind-hearted gentleman, and the clergyman told him all about Tommy and Marguerite, the kind gentleman pitied them and ordered Marguerite a pair of shoes and gave Mr. Smith money to buy her some clothes, which she needed sadly. As for Tommy, he said he would take him off to the sea with him and make him a sailor. After a few days, the gentleman said he must go to London and would take Tommy with him, and sad was the parting between the two children. Poor Marguerite was very lonely indeed without her brother and might have cried herself sick but for the new shoes that were brought home to her. They turned her thoughts from her grief, and, as soon as she had put them on, she ran in to Mrs. Smith and cried out, Two shoes, ma'am, two shoes. These words she repeated to everyone she met, and thus it was she got the name of Goody Two Shoes. Little Marguerite had seen how good and wise Mr. Smith was, and thought it was because of his great learning, and she wanted above all things to learn to read at last she made up her mind to ask mr smith to teach her 
when he had a moment to spare. He readily agreed to this, and Marguerite read to him an hour every day and spent much time with her books. When she laid out a plan for teaching others more ignorant than herself, she cut out of thin pieces of wood ten sets of large and small letters of the alphabet and carried these with her when she went from house to house. When she came to Billy Wilson's, she threw down the letters all in a heap and Billy picked them out and sorted them in lines thus A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K and so on until all the letters were in their right places. From there, Goody Two Shoes trotted off to another cottage, and here were several children waiting for her. As soon as the little girl came in, they all crowded around her and were eager to begin their lessons at once. Then she threw the letters down and said to the boy next to her, What did you have for the dinner today? Bread, answered the little boy. Well, put down the first letter, said Goody Two Shoes. Then he put down B, and the next child R, and the next E, and the next A, and the next D. And there was the whole word, bread. What did you have for dinner, Polly Driggs? Apple pie, said Polly. Upon which she laid down the first letter A, and the next put down a P, and the next another P, and so on, until the words apple and pie were united, and, st and stood thus, apple pie. Now it happened one evening that Goody Two Shoes were going home rather late. She had made a longer round than usual, and everybody had kept her waiting, so that night came on before her day's work was gone. Right glad was she to set out for her own home, and she walked along contentedly through the fields and lanes and roads, enjoying the quiet evening. The evening was not cool, however, but close and sultry, and betokened a storm. Presently a drop fell on Grody's face. What should she do? If she did not make haste, she would soon be wet to the skin. Fortunately, there was an old barn down the road in which she could find shelter, and the goody two shoes gathered her skirts about her and took to her heels and ran as if somebody was after her. The owner of the barn had died lately, and the property was to be sold, and there was a lot of loose hay on the floor which had not yet been taken away. Goody Two-Shoes cuddled down in the soft hay, glad of a chance to rest her weary limbs and quite out of the breath with her long run. And just then down rattled the rain, the thunder roared, the lightning flashed, and the old barn trembled, and so did Goody Two-Shoes. She had not been there long before she heard footsteps, and the three men came into the barn for shelter. The hay was piled up between her and them, so that they could not see her, and thinking they were alone, they spoke quite loudly. They were plotting to rob Squire Truman, who lived in the great house in Marguerite's village, and were to break in and steal all they could that very night. This was quite enough for Goody Two Shoes. She waited for nothing but dashed out of the barn and ran through rain and mud till she came to the squire's house. He was at dinner with some friends, and anyone else but Goody would have found it difficult to gain admission to him. But she was well known to the servants, and was so kind and obliging that even the big fat butler could not refuse to do her bidding and went and told the squire that Goody Two Shoes wished very much to see him. So the squire asked his friends to excuse him for a moment and came out and said, Well, Goody Two Shoes, my good girl, what is it? Oh, sir, she replied, if you do not take care, you will be robbed and murdered this very night. Then she told all she had heard the men say while she was in the barn. The squire saw there was not a moment to lose, so he went back and told his friends the news he had heard. They all said they would stay and help him take the thieves. So the lights were put out to make it appear as if all the people in the house were in bed, and servants and all kept a close watch both inside and outside. Sure enough, at about one o'clock in the morning, the three men came creeping up to the house with a dark lantern and the tools to break in with. Before they were aware, six men sprang out on them and held them fast. The thieves struggled in vain to get away. They were locked in the outhouse until daylight, when a cart came and took them off to jail. They were afterwards sent out of the country, where they had to work in chains on the roads, and it is said that one of them behaved so well that he was pardoned, and went to live in Australia, where he became a rich man. The other two went from bad to worse, and it is likely that they came to some dreadful end for sin never goes unpunished. But to return to Goody Two-Shoes, 
one day as she was walking through the village she saw some wicked boys with a raven at which they were going to throw stones to stop this cruel sport she gave the boys a penny for the raven and brought the bird home with her she gave him the name of raft and he proved to be a very clever creature indeed she taught him to spell and to read and he was so fond of playing with the large letters that the children called him ralph's alphabet some days after goody had met with the raven she was passing through a field when she saw some naughty boys who had taken a pigeon and tied a string to its legs in order to let it fly and draw it back again when they pleased goody could not bear to see anything tortured like that so she brought the pigeon from the boys and taught him how to spell and read but he could not talk and as ralph the raven took the large letters peter the pigeon took care of the small ones mrs williams who lived in marjorie's village kept school and taught little ones their abcs she was now old and feeble and wanted to give up this important trust this being known to sir william doe he asked mrs williams to examine goody two shoes and see if she was not clever enough for the office this was done and mrs williams reported that little marjorie was the best scholar and had the best heart of any one she had ever examined all the country had a great opinion of mrs williams and this report made them think highly of miss marjorie as we must now call her so marjorie meanwhile was now a schoolmistress and a capital one she made the children all loved her for she was never weary of making plans for their happiness the room in which she taught was large and lofty and there was plenty of fresh air in it and as she knew that children liked to move about she placed her sets of letters all round the school so that everyone was obliged to get up to find a letter or spell a word when it came their turn this exercise not only kept the children in good health but fixed the letters firmly in their minds the neighbors were very good to her and one of them made her a present of a little kylark whose early morning song told the lazy boys and girls that it was time they were out of bed some time after this a poor lamb lost its dam and the farmer being about to kill her she bought it out of him and brought it home to play with the children soon after this a present was made to miss marjorie of a dog and as he was always in good humor and always jumping about the children gave him the name of jumper it was his duty to guard the door and no one could go out or come in without leave from his mistress marjorie was so wise and good that some foolish people accused her of being a witch and she was taken to court and tried before the judge she soon proved that she was a most sensible woman and sir charles jones was so pleased with her that he offered her a large sum of money to take care of his family and educate his daughter at first she refused but afterwards went and behaved so well and was so kind and tender that sir charles would not permit her to leave the house and soon after made her an offer of marriage the neighbors came in crowds to the wedding and all were glad that one who had been such a good girl and had grown up such a good woman was to become a grand lady just as the clergyman had opened his book a gentleman richly dressed ran into the church and cried stop stop great alarm was felt especially by the bride and groom with whom he said he wished to speak privately sir charles stood motionless with surprise and the bride fainted away in the stranger's arms for this richly dressed gentleman turned out to be a little tommy meanwell who had just come from the sea where he had made a large fortune sir charles and lady jones lived happily ever after together and the great lady did not forget the children but was just as good to them as she had always been she was also kind and good to the poor and the sick and a friend to all who were in distress her life was a great blessing and her death the greatest calamity that ever took place in the neighborhood where she lived and was known as goody two shoes end of goody two shoes recorded by pooja dubey mumbai india golden bird by the brothers grim this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org a certain king had a beautiful garden and in the garden stood a tree which bore golden apples these apples were always counted and about the time when they began to grow ripe it was found that every night one of them was gone 
the king became very angry at this and ordered the gardener to keep watch all night under the tree the gardener set his eldest son to watch but about twelve o'clock he fell asleep and in the morning another of the apples was missing then the second son was ordered to watch and at midnight he too fell asleep and in the morning another apple was gone then the third son offered to keep watch but the gardener at first would not let him for fear some harm should come to him however at last he consented and the young man laid himself under the tree to watch as the clock struck twelve he heard a rustling noise in the air and a bird came flying that was of pure gold and as it was snapping at one of the apples with its beak the gardener's son jumped up and shot an arrow at it but the arrow did the bird no harm only dropped a golden feather from its tail and then flew away the golden feather was brought to the king in the morning and all the council was called together every one agreed that it was worth more than all the wealth of the kingdom but the king said one feather is of no use to me i must have the whole bird then the gardener's eldest son set out and thought to find the gold bird very easily and when he had gone but a little way he came to wood and by the side of the wood he saw a fox sitting so he took his bow and made ready to shoot at it then the fox said do not shoot me for i will give you good counsel i know what your business is and that you want to find a golden bird you will reach a village in the evening and when you get there you will see two inns opposite to each other one of them is very pleasant and beautiful to look at go not in there but rest for the night in the other though it may appear to you to be very poor and mean but the son thought to himself what can such a beast as this know about the matter so he shot his arrow at the fox but he missed it and it set up its tail above its back and ran into the wood then he went his way and in the evening came to the village where the two inns were and in one of these were people singing and dancing and feasting but the other looked very dirty and poor i should be very silly said he if i went to that shabby house and left this charming place so he went to the smart house and ate and drank at his ease and forgot the bird and his country too time passed on and as the elder son did not come back and no tidings were heard of him the second son set out and the same thing happened to him he met the fox who gave him the good advice but when he came to the two inns his eldest brother was standing at the window where the merry-making was and called to him to come in and he could not withstand the temptation but went in and forgot the golden bird and his country in the same manner time passed on again and the youngest son too wished to set out in the wide world to seek for the golden bird but this father would not listen to it for a long while for he was very fond of his son and was afraid that some ill luck might happen to him also and prevent his coming back however at last it was agreed he should go for he would not rest at home and as he came to the wood he met the fox and heard the same good counsel but he was thankful to the fox and did not obtain his life as brothers had done still upon my tail and you will travel faster so he sat down and the fox began to run away they went over stock and stone so quick that their hair whistled in the wind when they came to the village the son followed the fox counsel and without looking about him went to the shabby inn and rested there all night at his ease in the morning came the fox again and met him as he was beginning his journey and said go straight forward till you come to a castle before which lie a whole troop of soldiers fast asleep and snoring take no notice of them but go into the castle and pass on and on till you come to a room where the golden bird sits in a wooden cage close by it stands a beautiful golden cage but do not try to take the bird out of the shabby cage and put it into the handsome one otherwise you will repent it when the fox stretched out his tail again the young man sat himself down and away they went over stock and stone till their hair whistled in the wind before the castle gate all was as the fox had said so the son went in and found the chamber where the golden bird hung in a wooden cage and below stood the golden cage and the three golden apples that had been lost were lying close by it then thought he to himself 
it will be a very droll thing to bring away such a fine bird in the shabby cage so he opened the door and took hold of it and put it into the golden cage but the bird set up such a loud scream that all the soldiers awoke and they took him prisoner and carried him before the king the next morning the court sat to judge him and when all was heard it sentenced him to die unless he should bring the king the golden horse which would run as swiftly as the wind and if he did this he was to have the golden bird given him for his own so he set out once more on his journey sighing and in great despair when on a sudden his friend fox met him and said you see now what has happened on account of your not listening to my counsel i will still however tell you how to find the golden horse if you will do as i bid you you must go straight on till you come to the castle where the horse stands in his stall by his side will lie the groom fast asleep and snoring take away the horse quietly but be sure to put out the old lantern saddle upon him and not the golden one that is close by it then the sun sat down on the fox's tail and away they went over stock and stone till their hair whistled in the wind all went right and the groom lay snoring with his hand upon the golden saddle but when the sun looked at the horse he thought a great pity to put the leathern saddle upon it i will give him the good one said he i am sure he deserves it as he took up the golden saddle the groom awoke and cried out so loud that all the guards ran in and took him prisoner and in the morning he was again brought before the court to be judged and was sentenced to die but it was agreed that if he could bring thither the beautiful princess he should live and have the bird and the horse with him for his own then he went his way very sorrowful but the old fox came and said why did not you listen to me if you had you would have carried away both the bird and the horse yet will i once more give you a counsel go straight on and in the evening you will arrive at a castle at twelve o'clock at night the princess goes to the bathing house go up to her give her a kiss and she will let you lead her away but take care do not suffer her to go and take leave of her father and mother then the fox stretched out his tail and so away they went over stock and stone till their hair whistled again as they came to the castle all was as fox had said and at twelve o'clock the younger man met the princess going to the bath and gave her the kiss and she agreed to run away with him but begged with many tears that he would let her take leave of her father at first he refused but she wept still more and more and fell at his feet till at last he consented but the moment she came to her father's house the guards awoke and he was taken prisoner again then he was brought before the king and the king said you shall never have my daughter unless in eight days you dig away the hill that stops the view from my window now this hill was so big that the whole world would not take it away and when he had worked for seven days and had done very little the fox came and said lie down and go to sleep i'll work for you and in the morning he awoke and the hill was gone so he went merrily to the king and told him that now that it was removed he must give him the princess then the king was obliged to keep his word and away went the young man the princess and the fox came and said to him we will have all three the princess the horse and the bird ah said the young man that would be a great thing but how can you contrive it if you will only listen said the fox it can be done when you come to the king and he asks for the beautiful princess you must say here she is then he will be very joyful and you will mount the golden horse that they are to give you and put out your hand to take leave of them but shake hands with the princess last then lift her quickly on to the horse behind you clap your spurs to his side and gallop away as fast as you can all went right then the fox said when you come to the castle where the bird is i will stay with the princess at the door and you will ride in and speak to the king and when he sees that it is the right horse he will bring out the bird but you must sit still and say that you want to look at to see whether it is a true golden bird and when you get it into your hand right away this too happened as the fox said they carried off the bird the princess mounted again and they rode on to a great wood then the fox came and said pray kill me and cut off my head and my feet but the young man refused to do it so the fox said i will at any rate give you good counsel beware of two things 
ransom no one from the gallows and sit down by the side of no river then away he went well thought the young man it is no hard matter to keep that advice he rode on with the princess till at last he came to the village where he had left his two brothers and there he heard a great noise and uproar and when he asked what was the matter the people said two men are going to be hanged as he came nearer he saw that the two men were his brothers who had turned robbers so he said cannot they in any way be saved but the people said no unless he would bestow all his money upon the rascals and buy their liberty then he did not say to think about the matter but paid what was asked and his brothers were given up and went on with him towards their home and as they came to the wood where the fox first met him it was so cool and pleasant that the two brothers said let us sit down by the side of the river and rest a while to eat and drink so he said yes and forgot the fox's counsel and sat down on the side of the river while he suspected nothing they came behind and threw him down the bank and took the princess the horse and the bird and went home to the king their master and said all this we have won by our labor then there was great rejoicing made but the horse would not eat the bird would not sing and the princess wept the youngest son fell to the bottom of the river's bed luckily it was nearly dry but his bones were almost broken and the bank was so steep that he could find no way to get out then the old fox came once more and scolded him for not following his advice otherwise no evil would have befallen him yet said he i cannot leave you here so lay hold of my tail and hold fast then he pulled him out of the river and said to him as he got upon the bank your brothers have set watch to kill you if they find you in the kingdom so he dressed himself as a poor man and came secretly to the king's court and was scarcely within the doors when the horse began to eat and the bird began to sing and the princess left off weeping then he went to the king and told him all his brothers roguery and they were seized and punished and he had the princess given to him again and after the king's death he was hired to the kingdom a long while after he went to walk one day in the wood and the old fox met him and besought him with tears in his eyes to kill him and cut off his head and feet and at last he did so and in a moment the fox was changed into a man and turned out to be the brother of the princess who had been lost a great many many years end of the golden bird recorded by pooja dubey mumbai india a carrier's dog by percy j billinghurst this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org a carrier on his way to a market town had occasion to stop at some houses by the roadside in the way of his business leaving his cart and horse upon the public road under the protection of a passenger and a trusty dog upon his return he missed a led horse belonging to a gentleman in the neighbourhood which he had tied to the end of the cart and likewise one of the female passengers on inquiry he was informed that during his absence the female who had been anxious to try the mettle of the pony had mounted it and that the animal had set off at full speed the carrier expressed much anxiety for the safety of the young woman casting at the same time an expressive look at his dog oscar observed his master's eye and aware of its meaning instantly set off in pursuit of the pony which coming up was soon after he made a sudden spring seized the bridle and held the animal fast several people having observed the circumstance and the perilous situation of the girl came to relieve her oscar however notwithstanding their repeated endeavours would not quit his hold and the pony was actually led into the stable with the dog till such time as the carrier should arrive upon the carrier entering the stable oscar wagged his tail in token of satisfaction and immediately relinquished the bridle to his master End of a carrier's dog 
by Percy J. Billinghurst. The Charles Woman by S. O. L. McPherson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In the days when the world was fresh from the Creator's hand, there lived a woman who had no children. Because of this, she grieved much and wept in secret, for her husband had ceased to love her, while the other women of the village mocked and pointed their fingers at her as she passed. One day, when she was seated at the door of her hut, two pigeons flew in and scattered the ashes of the fire over the floor, calling to one another, Vukutu, Vukutu. They also come to mock me, said the woman, because I have no child to scatter the ashes. And she bent her head and wept anew. Then one of the pigeons came to her, saying, Make a wound in your breast, and let the blood from the wound fall into this pot, cover it over, and there let it be for nine months. But when the ninth moon is at the full, take off the cover, and in the pot you will find a child. The woman did as the pigeon had commanded and for nine long months she guarded the pot which stood in a corner of the hut, wondering and turning over in her heart the words which the pigeon had spoken. When the ninth month hung a great golden ball in the heavens, she knelt before the pot and lifted the cover, and there within lay a beautiful man-child, stronger and fairer than any baby born was in the crawl. While she knelt, the woman heard a sudden fluttering of wings, and through the door of the hut there flew in a pigeon. Wrap your child in blankets, it said. Wrap him up well, and keep him hidden from sight, that the other woman may not see him. Then the bird flew out into the moonlight, and there came another, saying, Give your son food enough for a man, that he may grow quickly. So the woman wrapped the child in blankets, and took him to the back of the hut, that none who passed might see him. She gave him food enough for a man, as the pigeon has said, and before the sunset on the next day, he had grown from a helpless baby to a youth tall and lissom as a sapling. When darkness fell, the woman lit a fire in her hut, and again covered her son with blankets, bidding him lie still lest he should be seen. That night her husband returned from a hunting expedition. He was weary and sat down to rest while she made ready his supper, nor did he perceived the boy who was hidden at the back of the hut. When the woman had served her husband, she took a portion and set it before her son, saying, Eat this, my child. Whose child is this? asked the man. To whom are you giving meat? To my son, answered the woman. But you have no son, he exclaimed. Nay, but I have, said she. The pigeons told me to draw blood from my breast and let it lie in a pot until it grew to be a child. I listened to their wisdom, and behold, here is my son. The man was overjoyed, and the woman rejoiced because her reproach had been taken from her. They lived together in peace and happiness until the end of their days. End of The Childless Woman by S. O. L. McPherson Read by Katarina Huang
Hunting for Something by Arthur Scott Bailey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. It was a pleasant summer's night. Anyone would have supposed that it was just the sort of weather that Danny Badger might have chosen for digging holes. But he must have thought that he had dug enough holes for the time being. He wandered about as if he had lost a hole somewhere and couldn't find it. And whenever he spied a hole made by one of his smaller neighbors, he stopped and looked at it closely. But none of them seemed to be the one he was looking for. At least Benny examined a good many of holes, and then passed on again, before he came to one at last that was different from all the rest. If you could have seen the look of pleasure on Benny's odd face when he caught sight of this particular hole, you would have known at once that his search had come to an end. Now, as a matter of fact, Benny Badger had not lost a hole. His strange behavior did not mean that. It meant that he was searching for a fresh hole, which some ground squirrel had dug so short a time before that there couldn't be much doubt that the small owner was then living in it. To be sure, Benny might have dug his way to the furthest end of each hole that he found that night, and doubtless he would have enjoyed such a pastime. But as for finding a plump ground squirrel at the end of every tunnel, ah! that would have been a different matter no such pleasant sight would have greeted benny's eyes and on this evening he wanted to find some such reward when his digging came to an end he knew as well as he knew anything in the world that newly scattered earth never lay strewn about the doorway of an old hole and that was the reason he passed by so many holes with hardly more than a swift glance but when at length he found what he had been looking for, a hole with fresh brown dirt scattered carelessly around it, Benny Badger showed by every one of his actions that he didn't intend to move on until he had burrowed to the very end of it. A broad smile lightened up his queerly marked face. At least he opened his mouth and showed a good many of his teeth and a bright, eager glint came into his eyes, whereas they had had a somewhat wistful look before, as if their owner might have been hungry and didn't exactly know where he was going to find a meal. Then Benny Badger looked all around to see whether anybody might be watching him, but there was no one in sight, and if there had been, Benny Badger would have done no more than tell him that he had better run along about his business, because it would do him no good to wait. None at all. And if the onlooker had happened to come so near as to bother Benny and what he intended to do, that unfortunate person might have wished that he had taken a bit of friendly advice in time and made himself scarce. But, of course... Benny Badger was not so foolish as to give any such warning, for there was no one in sight to hear it. End of Hunting for Something by Arthur Scott Bailey The Frog Prince by The Brothers Grimm This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. One fine evening, a young princess put on her bonnet and clogs and went out to take a walk by herself in the wood. And when she came to a cool spring of water that rose in the midst of it, she sat herself down to rest a while. Now she had a golden ball in her hand, which was her favourite plaything, and she was always tossing it up into the air and catching it again as it fell. After a time, she threw it up so high that she missed catching it as it fell, and the ball bounded away and rolled along upon the ground, till at last it fell down into a spring. The princess looked into the spring after her ball, but it was very deep, so deep that she could not see the bottom of it. 
Then she began to bewail her loss, and said, Alas, if only I could get my ball again, I would give all my fine clothes and jewels, and everything that I have in the world. While she was speaking, a frog put its head out of the water, and said, Princess, why do you weep so bitterly? Alas, said she, what can you do for me, you nasty frog? My golden ball has fallen into the spring. The frog said, I want not your pearls, and your jewels, and fine clothes, but if you will love me, and let me live with you, and eat from your golden plate, and sleep upon your bed, I will bring you your ball again. What nonsense, thought the princess, this silly little frog is talking. He can never even get out of the spring to visit me, though he may be able to get my ball back for me, and therefore I will tell him he shall have what he asks. So she said to the frog, Well, if you will bring me my ball, I will do all you ask. Then the frog put his head down, and dived deep under the water, and after a little while he came up again with the ball in his mouth, and threw it on the edge of the spring. As soon as the young princess saw her ball, she ran to pick it up, and she was so overjoyed to have it in her hand again, that she never thought of the frog, but ran home with it as fast as she could. The frog called after her, Stay, princess, and take me with you as you said, but she did not stop to hear a word. The next day, just as the princess had sat down to dinner, she heard a strange noise, tap, tap, plash, plash, as if something was coming up the marble staircase, and soon afterwards there was a gentle knock at the door, and a little voice cried out and said, Open the door, my princess dear, open the door to thy true love here, and mind the words that thou and I said, by the fountain cool in the greenwood shade. Then the princess ran to the door and opened it, and there she saw the frog, whom she had quite forgotten. At this sight she was sadly frightened, and shutting the door as fast as she could, came back to her seat. The king, her father, seeing that something had frightened her, asked her what was the matter. "'There is this frog,' said she, "'at the door that lifted my ball for me out of the spring this morning. I told him that he should live with me here, thinking he could never get out of the spring, but there he is at the door, and he wants to come in.' While she was speaking, the frog knocked again at the door, and said, Open the door, my princess dear, open the door to thy true love here, and mind the words that thou and I said, by the fountain cool in the greenwood shade. Then the king said to the young princess, As you have given your word, you must keep it, so go and let him in. She did so, and the frog hopped into the room, and then straight on, tap, tap, plash, plash, from the bottom of the room to the top till he came up close to the table where the princess sat. "'Pray lift me upon your chair,' said he to the princess, "'and let me sit next to you.' As soon as she had done this, the frog said, "'Put your plate nearer to me, that I may eat out of it.' This she did, and when he had eaten as much as he could, he said, "'Now I am tired. Carry me upstairs and put me into your bed.' And the princess, though very unwilling, took him up in her hand, and put him upon the pillow of her own bed, where he slept all night long. As soon as it was light, he jumped up, hopped downstairs, and went out of the house. Now then, thought the princess, at last he is gone, and I shall be troubled with him no more. But she was mistaken, for when night came again, she heard the same tapping at the door, and the frog came once more, and said, Open the door, my princess dear, open the door to thy true love here. And mind the words that thou and I said, by the fountain cool in the greenwood shade. And when the princess opened the door, the frog came in, and slept upon her pillow as before, till the morning broke, and the third night he did the same. But when the princess awoke on the following morning, she was astonished to see, instead of a frog, a handsome prince, gazing on her with the most beautiful eyes she had ever seen, and standing at the head of her bed. He told her that he had been enchanted by a spiteful fairy, whom had changed him into a frog, and that he had been fated so to abide till some princess should take him out of the spring, and let him eat from her plate, and sleep upon her bed for three nights. You, said the prince, have broken this cruel charm, and now I have nothing to wish for but that you shall go with me into my father's kingdom, where I will marry you, and love you as long as you live. The young princess, you may be sure, 
was not long in saying yes to all this, and as they spoke a gay coach drove up with eight beautiful horses, decked with plumes of feathers and a golden harness, and behind the coach rode the prince's servant, faithful Heinrich, who had bewailed the misfortunes of his dear master during this enchantment so long and so bitterly that his heart had well nigh burst. They then took leave of the king, and got into the coach with eight horses, and all set out, full of joy and merriment, for the prince's kingdom, which they reached safely, and there they lived happily a great many years. End of The Frog Prince by Brothers Grimm Read by Becky The Pig Brother by Laura Elizabeth Howe Richards this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. There was once a child who was untidy. He left his books on the floor and his muddy shoes on the table. He put his fingers in the jam pots and spilled ink on his best pinafore. There was really no end to his untidiness. One day the tidy angel came into his nursery. This will never do, said the angel. This is really shocking. You must go out and stay with your brother while I set things to right here. I have no brother, said the child. Yes, you have, said the angel. You may not know him, but he will know you. Go out in the garden and watch for him, and he will soon come. I don't know what you mean said the child but he went out into the garden and waited presently a squirrel came along whisking his tail are you my brother asked the child the squirrel looked him over carefully well i should hope not he said my fur is neat and smooth my nest is handsomely made and in perfect order and my young ones are properly brought up why do you insult me by asking such a question he whisked off, and the child waited. Presently, a wren came hopping by. "'Are you my brother?' asked the child. "'No, indeed,' said the wren. "'What impertinence! You will find no tidier person than I in the whole garden. Not a feather is out of place, and my eggs are the wonder of all for smoothness and beauty. Brother, indeed!' He hopped off, ruffling his feathers, and the child waited. By and by a large tommy cat came along are you my brother asked the child go and look at yourself in the glass said the tommy cat haughtily and you will have your answer i have been washing myself in the sun all morning while it is clear that no water has come near you for a long time there are no such creatures as you in my family i am humbly thankful to say he walked on waving his tail and the child waited presently a pig came trotting along the child did not wish to ask the pig if he were his brother but the pig did not wait to be asked hello brother he grunted i am not your brother said the child oh yes you are said the pig i confess i am not proud of you but there is no mistaking the members of our family come along and have a good roll in the barnyard there is some lovely black mud there i don't like to roll in mud said the child tell that to the hens said the pig brother look at your hands and your shoes and your pinafore come along i say you may have some of the pig wash for supper if there is more than i want i don't want pig wash said the child and he began to cry just then the tidy angel came out I have set everything to rights she said and so it must stay now will you go with the pig brother or will you come back with me and be a tidy child with you with you cried the child and he clung to the angel's dress the pig brother grunted small loss he said there will be all the more wash for me and he trotted on end of the pig brother by laura elizabeth howe richards Read by Lynn Thompson The Coming of the King by Laura Elizabeth Howe Richards This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Some children were at play in their playground one day when a herald rode through the town, blowing a trumpet and crying aloud, The king! The king passes by this road today. Make ready for the king. The children stopped their play and looked at one another. Did you hear that? they said. The king is coming. He may look over the wall and see our playground. Who knows? We must put it in order. The playground was sadly dirty, and in the corners were scraps of paper and broken toys, for these were careless children. But now one brought a hoe and another a rake and a third ran to fetch the wheelbarrow from behind the garden gate they labored hard till at length all was clean and tidy now it is clean they said but we must make it pretty too for kings are used to fine things maybe he would not notice mere cleanness for he may have it all the time then one brought sweet rushes and strewed them on the ground and others made garlands of oak leaves and pine tassels and hung them on the walls and the littlest one pulled marigold buds and threw them all about on the playground to look like gold he said when all was done the playground was so beautiful that the children stood and looked at it and clapped their hands with pleasure let us keep it always like this said the littlest one and the others cried yes yes that is what we will do they waited all day for the coming of the king but he never came only towards sunset a man with travel-worn clothes and a kind tired face passed along the road and stopped to look over the wall what a pleasant place said the man may i come in and rest dear children the children brought him in gladly and set him on the seat that they had made out of an old cask they had covered it with the old red cloak to make it look like a throne and it made a very good one it is our playground they said we made it pretty for the king but he did not come and now we mean to keep it so for ourselves that is good said the man because we think pretty and clean is nicer than ugly and dirty said another that is better said the man and for tired people to rest in said the littlest one that is best of all said the man he sat and rested and looked at the children with such kind eyes that they came about him and told him all they knew about the five puppies in the barn and the thrush's nest with four blue eggs and the shore where the gold shells grew and the man nodded and understood all about it by and by he asked for a cup of water and they brought it to him in the best cup with the gold sprigs on it then he thanked the children and rose and went on his way but before he went he laid his hand on their heads for a moment and the touch went warm to their hearts the children stood by the wall and watched the man as he went slowly along the sun was setting and the light fell in long slanting rays across the road he looks so tired said one of the children but he was so kind said another see said the littlest one how the sun shines on his hair it looks like a crown of gold end of the coming of the king by laura elizabeth howe richards read by lynn thompson The Golden Goose from the Jataka Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Once upon a time there was a goose who had beautiful golden feathers. Not far away from this goose lived a poor, a very poor woman who had two daughters. The goose saw that they had a hard time to get along, and said he to himself, If I give them one after another of my golden feathers, 
the mother can sell them and with the money they bring she and her daughters can live in comfort so away the goose flew to the poor woman's house seeing the goose the woman said why do you come here we have nothing to give you but i have something to give you said the goose i will give you my feathers one by one and you can sell them for enough so that you and your daughters can live in comfort so saying the goose gave her one of his feathers and then flew away from time to time he came back each time leaving another feather the mother and her daughters sold the beautiful feathers for enough money to keep them in comfort but one day the mother said to her daughters let us not trust this goose some day he may fly away and never come back then we should be poor again let us get all of his feathers the very next time he comes the daughters said this will hurt the goose we will not do such a thing but the mother was greedy the next time the golden goose came she took hold of him with both hands and pulled out every one of his feathers now the golden goose has strange feathers if his feathers are plucked out against his wish they no longer remain golden but turn white and are of no more value than chicken feathers the new ones that come in are not golden but plain white as time went on his feathers grew again and then he flew away to his home and never came back again end of the golden goose from the dataka tales the story of kiesh by jack london this librivox recording is in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana the story of kiesh kiesh lived long ago on the rim of the polar sea was head man of his village through many and prosperous years and died full of honors with his name on the lips of men so long ago did he live that only the old men remember his name his name and the tale which they got from the old men before them and which the old men to come will tell to their children and their children's children down to the end of time and the winter darkness when the north gales make their long sweep across the ice pack and the air is filled with flying white and no man may venture forth is the chosen time for the telling of how kiesh from the poorest igloo in the village rose to power and place over them all he was a bright boy so the tale runs healthy and strong and he had seen thirteen sons in their way of reckoning time for each winter the sun leaves the land in darkness and the next year a new sun returns so that they may be warm again and look upon one another's faces the father of kiesh had been a very brave man but he had met his death in a time of famine when he sought to save the lives of his people by taking the life of a great polar bear in his eagerness he came to close grapples with the bear and his bones were crushed but the bear had much meat on him and the people were saved kiesh was his only son and after that kiesh lived alone with his mother but the people are prone to forget and they forgot the deed of his father and he being but a boy and his mother only a woman they too were swiftly forgotten and ere long came to live in the meanest of all the igloos it was at a council one night in the big igloo of kloshquan the chief that kiesh showed the blood that ran in his veins and the manhood that stiffened his back with the dignity of an elder he rose to his feet and waited for silence amid the babble of voices it is true that meat be apportioned me and mine he said but it is oftentimes old and tough this meat and moreover it has an unusual quantity of bones the hunters grizzled and gray and lusty and young were aghast 
the like had never been known before a child that talked like a grown man and said harsh things to their very faces but steadily and with seriousness kiesch went on for that i know my father bach was a great hunter i speak these words it is said that bach brought home more meat than any of the two best hunters that with his own hands he attended to the division of it that with his own eyes he saw to it that the least old woman and the last old man received fair share nah nah the men cried put the child out send him off to bed he is no man that he should talk to men and graybeards he waited calmly till the uproar died down thou hast a wife ugh gluck he said and for her dost thou speak and thou too masuk a mother also and for them dost thou speak my mother has no one save me wherefore i speak as i say though bach be dead because he hunted over keenly it's just that i who am his son and that ikiga who is my mother and was his wife should have meat in plenty so long as there be meat in plenty in the tribe i kiesh the son of bach have spoken he sat down his ears keenly alert to the flood of protest and indignation his words had created that a boy should speak in council old uglug was mumbling shall the babes in arms tell us men the things we shall do masuk demanded in a loud voice am i a man that i should be made a mock by every child that cries for meat the anger boiled a white heat they ordered him to bed threatened that he should have no meat at all and promised him sore beatings for his presumption kiesha's eyes began to flash and the blood to pound darkly under his skin in the midst of the abuse he sprang to his feet hear me ye men he cried never shall i speak in this council again never again till the men come to me and say it is well kiesh that thou shouldst speak it is well and it is our wish take this now ye men for my last word bach my father was a great hunter i too his son shall go and hunt the meat that i eat and be it known now that the division of that which i kill shall be fair and no widow nor weak one shall cry in the night because there is no meat when the strong men are groaning in great pain for that they have eaten overmuch and in the days to come there shall be shame upon the strong men who have eaten overmuch i kiesh have said it jeers and scornful laughter followed him out of the igloo but his jaw was set and he went his way looking neither to right nor left the next day he went forth along the shoreline where the ice and the land met together those who saw him go noted that he carried his bow with a goodly supply of bone barbed arrows and that across his shoulder was his father's big hunting spear and there was laughter and much talk at the event it was an unprecedented occurrence never did boys of his tender age go forth to hunt much less to hunt alone also were there shaking of heads and prophetic mutterings and the women looked pityingly at ikiga and her face was grave and sad he will be back ere long they said cheerily let him go it will teach him a lesson the hunters said and he will come back shortly and he will be meek and soft of speech in the days to follow but a day passed and a second and on the third a wild gale blew and there was no kiesh ikiga tore her hair and put soot of the seal oil on her face in token of her grief and the women assailed the men with bitter words in that they had mistreated the boy and sent him to his death and the men made no answer preparing to go in search of the body when the storm abated early next morning however kiesh strode into the village but he came not shamefacedly across his shoulders he bore a burden of fresh killed meat and there was importance in his step and arrogance in his speech go ye men with the dogs and sleds and take my trail for the better part of a day's travel he said there is much meat on the ice a she-bear and two half-grown cubs ikiga was overcome with joy 
but he received her demonstrations in manlike fashion saying come aikiga let us eat and after that i shall sleep for i am weary and he passed into their igloo and ate profoundly and after that slept for twenty running hours there was much doubt at first much doubt and discussion the killing of a polar bear is very dangerous but thrice dangerous is it and three times thrice to kill a mother bear with her cubs the men could not bring themselves to believe that the boy kiesh single-handed had accomplished so great a marvel but the women spoke of the fresh killed meat he had brought on his back and this was an overwhelming argument against their unbelief so they finally departed grumbling greatly that in all probability if the thing were so he had neglected to cut up the carcasses now in the north it is very necessary that this should be done as soon as the kill is made if not the meat freezes so solidly as to turn the edge of the sharpest knife and a three hundred pound bear frozen stiff is no easy thing to put upon a sled and haul over the rough ice but arrived at the spot they found not only the kill which they had doubted but that kiesh had quartered the beasts in true hunter fashion and removed the entrails thus began the mystery of kiesh a mystery that deepened and deepened with the passing of the days his very next trip he killed a young bear nearly full grown and on the trip following a large male bear and his mate he was ordinarily gone from three to four days though it was nothing unusual for him to stay away a week at a time on the ice field always he declined company on these expeditions and the people marveled how does he do it they demanded of one another never does he take a dog with him and dogs are of such great help too why dost thou hunt only bear Kwan once ventured to ask him and kiesh made fitting answer it is well known that there is more meat on the bear he said but there was also talk of witchcraft in the village he hunts with evil spirits some of the people contended wherefore his hunting is rewarded how else can it be save that he hunts with evil spirits maybe they be not evil but good these spirits others said it is known that his father was a mighty hunter may not his father hunt with him so that he may attain excellence and patience and understanding who knows nonetheless his success continued and the less skillful hunters were often kept busy hauling in his meat and in the division of it he was just as his father had done before him he saw to it that the least old woman and the last old man received a fair portion keeping no more for himself than his needs required and because of this and of his merit as a hunter he was looked upon with respect and even awe and there was talk of making him chief after old Kloshquan. because of the things he had done they looked for him to appear again in the council but he never came and they were ashamed to ask i am minded to build me an igloo he said one day to Kwan and a number of the hunters it shall be a large igloo wherein ikiga and i can dwell in comfort ay they nodded gravely but i have no time my business is hunting and it takes all my time so it is but just that the men and women of the village who eat my meat should build me my igloo and the igloo was built accordingly on a generous scale which exceeded even the dwelling of Kloshquan. kiesh and his mother moved into it and it was the first prosperity she had enjoyed since the death of bach nor was material prosperity alone hers for because of her wonderful son and the position he had given her she came to be looked upon as the first woman in all the village and the women were given to visiting her to asking her advice and to quoting her wisdom when arguments arose among themselves or with the men but it was the mystery of kiesh's marvelous hunting that took chief place in all their minds and one day uglux taxed him with witchcraft to his face it is charged uglux said ominously that thou dealest with evil spirits wherefore thy hunting is rewarded is not the meat good kiesh made answer 
has one in the village yet to fall sick from eating of it how dost thou know that witchcraft be concerned or dost thou guess in the dark merely because of the envy that consumes thee and Ugluk withdrew discomfited the women laughed at him as he walked away but in the council one night after long deliberation it was determined to put spies on his track when he went forth to hunt so that his methods might be learned so on his next trip bim and bon two young men and of hunters the craftiest followed after him taking care not to be seen after five days they returned their eyes bulging and their tongues a-tremble to tell what they had seen the council was hastily called in Klashquan's dwelling, and Bim took up the tale. Brothers, as commanded, we journeyed on the trail of Kiesh, and cunningly we journeyed so that he might not know. And midway of the first day he picked up with a great he-bear. It was a very great bear. None greater, Bon corroborated, and went on himself yet was the bear not inclined to fight for he turned away and made off slowly over the ice this we saw from the rocks of the shore and the bear came toward us and after him came kiesh very much unafraid and he shouted harsh words after the bear and waved his arms about and made much noise then did the bear grow angry and rise up on his hind legs and growl but kiesh walked right up to the bear ay bim continued the story right up to the bear kiesh walked and the bear took after him and kiesh ran away but as he ran he dropped a little round ball on the ice and the bear stopped and smelled of it then swallowed it up and kiesh continued to run away and drop little round balls and the bear continued to swallow them up exclamations and cries of doubt were being made and uglug expressed open unbelief with our own eyes we saw it bim affirmed and bon i with our own eyes and this continued until the bear stood suddenly upright and cried aloud in pain and thrashed his forepaws madly about and kiesh continued to make off over the ice to a safe distance but the bear gave him no notice being occupied with the misfortune the little round balls had wrought within him ay within him bim interrupted for he did claw at himself and leap about over the ice like a playful puppy save from the way he growled and squealed it was plain it was not play but pain never did i see such a sight nay never was such a sight seen bon took up the strain and furthermore it was such a large bear witchcraft a glug suggested i know not bon replied i tell only of what my eyes beheld and after a while the bear grew weak and tired for he was very heavy and he had jumped about with exceeding violence and he went off along the shore ice shaking his head slowly from side to side and sitting down ever and again to squeal and cry and kiesh followed after the bear and we followed after kiesh and for that day and three days more we followed the bear grew weak and never ceased crying from his pain it was a charm a gluck explained surely it was a charm it may well be and bim relieved bon the bear wandered now this way and now that doubling back and forth and crossing his trail in circles so that at the end he was near where kiesh had first come upon him by this time he was quite sick the bear and could crawl no farther so kiesh came up close and speared him to death and then Klashquan demanded then we left kish skinning the bear and came running that the news of the killing might be told and in the afternoon of that day the women hauled in the meat of the bear while the men sat in council assembled when kish arrived a messenger was sent to him bidding him come to the council but he sent reply saying that he was hungry and tired also that his igloo was large and comfortable and could hold many men and curiosity was so strong on the men that the whole council Klashquan to the fore rose up and went to the igloo of kish he was eating but he received them with respect and seated them according to their rank 
Akiga was proud and embarrassed by turns, but Kiesch was quite composed. Klashkwan recited the information brought by Bim and Bon, and at its close said in a stern voice, So explanation is wanted, O Kiesch, of thy manner of hunting. Is there witchcraft in it? Kiesch looked up and smiled. Nay, O Klashkwan, it is not for a boy to know aught of witches, and of witches I know nothing. I have but devised a means whereby I may kill the ice bear with ease. That is all. It be headcraft, not witchcraft. And may any man? Any man. There was a long silence. The men looked in one another's faces, and Kiesch went on eating. And, and... And wilt thou tell us, O Kish? Klosh Kwan finally asked in a tremulous voice. Yea, I will tell thee. Kish finished sucking the marrow bone and rose to his feet. It is quite simple. Behold. He picked up a thin strip of whalebone and showed it to them. The ends were sharp as needle points. The strip he coiled carefully till it disappeared in his hand. Then, suddenly releasing it, it sprang straight again. He picked up a piece of blubber. So, he said, one takes a small chunk of blubber thus, and thus makes it hollow. Then into the hollow goes the whalebone, so, tightly coiled, and another piece of blubber is fitted over the whalebone. After that, it is put outside where it freezes into a little round ball. The bear swallows the little round ball, the blubber melts, the whalebone with its sharp ends stands out straight, the bear gets sick, and when the bear is very sick, why, you kill him with a spear. It is quite simple. And Uglug said, Oh. And Kloshquan said, Ah. And each said something after his own manner, and all understood. And this is the story of Kish, who lived long ago on the rim of the polar sea. Because he exercised headcraft and not witchcraft, he rose from the meanest igloo to be head man of his village. His tribe was prosperous, and neither widow nor weak one cried aloud in the night because there was no meat. End of The Story of Kiesch by Jack London Beowulf from A Book of Famous Myths and Legends author unknown this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by pam castile old king hrothgar built for himself a great palace covered with gold with benches all round outside and a terrace leading up to it it was bigger than any hall men had ever heard of, and there Hrothgar sat on his throne to share with men the good things God had given him. A band of brave knights gathered round him, all living together in peace and joy. But there came a wicked monster, Grendel, out of the moors. He stole across the fens in the thick darkness and touched the great iron bars of the door of the hall, which immediately sprang open then with his eyes shooting out flame he spied the knights sleeping after battle with his steel finger-nails the hideous fiend seized thirty of them in their sleep he gave yells of joy and sped as quick as lightning across the moors to reach his home with his prey when the knights awoke they raised a great cry of sorrow whilst the aged king himself sat speechless with grief none could do battle with the monster he was too strong too horrible for any one to conquer for twelve long years grendel warred against hrothgar like a dark shadow of death he prowled round about the hall and lay in wait for his men on the misty moors one thing he could not touch and that was the king's sacred throne now there lived in a far-off land a youngster called beowulf who had the strength of thirty men. He heard of the wicked deeds of Grendel, and the sorrow of the good King Hrothgar. So he had made ready a strong ship, 
and with fourteen friends set sail to visit Hrothgar, as he was in need of help. The good ship flew over the swelling ocean like a bird, till in due time the voyagers saw shining white cliffs before them. Then they knew their journey was at an end. They made fast their ship, grasped their weapons, and thanked God that they had had an easy voyage. Now the coast guard spied them from a tower. He set off to the shore, riding on horseback and brandishing a huge lance. "'Who are you?' he cried, bearing arms and openly landing here. "'I am bound to know from whence you come before you make a step forward. Listen to my plain words, and hasten to answer me.' Beowulf made answer that they came as friends, to rid Hrothgar of his wicked enemy Grendel, and at that the coast guard led them on to guide them to the king's palace. Downhill they ran together, with a rushing sound of voices and armed tread, until they saw the hall shining like gold against the sky. The guard bade them go straight to it then, wheeling round on his horse, he said, "'It is time for me to go.' May the Father of all keep you in safety. For myself I must guard the coast. The street was paved with stone, and Beowulf's men marched along, following it to the hall, their armor shining in the sun and clanging as they went. They reached the terrace, where they set down their broad shields. Then they seated themselves on the bench, while they stacked their spears together and made themselves known to the herald. Hrothgar speedily bade them welcome. They entered the great hall with measured tread, Beowulf leading the way. His armor shone like a golden network, and his look was high and noble, as he said, Hail, O king, to fight against Grendel single-handed have I come. Grant me this, that I may have this task alone, I and my little band of men. I know that the terrible monster despises weapons, and therefore I shall bear neither sword nor shield nor buckler. Hand to hand I will fight the foe, and death shall come to whosoever God wills. If death overtakes me, then will the monster carry away my body to the swamps. So care not for my body, but send my armor to my king. My fate is in God's hands." Hrothgar loved the youth for his noble words, and bade him and his men sit down to the table, and merrily share the feast, if they had a mind to do so. As they feasted, a minstrel sang with a clear voice. The queen, in cloth of gold, moved down the hall, and handed the jeweled cup of mead to the king and all the warriors, old and young. At the right moment, with gracious words, she brought it to Beowulf. Full of pride and high purpose, the youth drank from the splendid cup, and vowed that he would conquer the enemy or die. When the sun sank in the west, all the guests arose. The king bade Beowulf guard the house and watch for the foe. Have courage, he said. Be watchful. Resolve on success. Not a wish of yours shall be left unfulfilled if you perform this mighty deed. Then Beowulf lay down to rest in the hall, putting off from him his coat of mail, helmet, and sword. Through the dim night Grendel came stealing. All slept in the darkness, all but one. The door sprang open at the first touch that the monster gave it. He trod quickly over the paved floor of the hall. His eyes gleamed as he saw a troop of kinsmen lying together asleep. He laughed as he reckoned on sucking the life of each one before day broke. He seized a sleeping warrior, and in a trice that crunched his bones. Then he stretched out his hand to seize Beowulf on his bed. Quickly did Beowulf grip his arm. He stood up full length and grappled with him with all his might, till his fingers cracked as though they would burst. Never had Grendel felt such a grip. He had a mind to go, but could not. He roared, and the hall resounded with his yells, as up and down he raged, with Beowulf holding him in a fast embrace. The benches were overturned, the timbers of the hall cracked, the beautiful hall was all but wrecked. Beowulf's men had seized their weapons and thought to hack Grendel on every side, but no blade could touch him. 
Still Beowulf held him by the arm, his shoulder cracked, and he fled, wounded to death, leaving hand, arm, and shoulder in Beowulf's grasp. Over the moors, into the darkness, he sped as best he might, and to Beowulf was the victory. Then in the morning many a warrior came from far and near, riding in troops they tracked the monster's path, where he had fled stricken to death. In a dismal pool he had yielded up his life. Racing their horses over the green turf, they reached again the paved street. The golden roof of the palace glittered in the sunlight. The king stood on the terrace and gave thanks to God. I have had much woe, he said, but this lad, through God's might, has done the deed that we, with all our wisdom, could not do. Now I will heartily love you, Beowulf, as if you were my son. You shall want for nothing in this world, and your fame shall live for ever. The palace was cleansed, the walls hung anew with cloth of gold, the whole palace was made fair and straight, for only the roof had been left altogether unhurt after the fight. A merry feast was held. The king brought forth out of his treasures a banner, helmet, and mail coat. These he gave to Beowulf, but more wonderful than all was a famous sword handed down to him through the ages. Then eight horses with golden cheek-plates were brought within the court. One of them was saddled with King Hrothgar's own saddle, decorated with silver. Hrothgar gave all to Beowulf, bidding him enjoy them well. To each of Beowulf's men he gave rich gifts. The minstrels sang. The queen, beautiful and gracious, bore the cup to the king and Beowulf. To Beowulf she too gave gifts, mantle and bracelets and collar of gold. Use these gifts, she said, and prosper well. As far as the sea rolls, your name shall be known. Great was the joy of all till evening came. Then the hall was cleared of benches and strewn with bed. Beowulf, like the king, had his own bower this night to sleep in. The nobles lay down in the hall. At their heads they set their shields and placed ready their helmets and their mail coats. Each slept ready in an instant to do battle for his lord. So they sank to rest, little dreaming what deep sorrow was to fall on them. Hrothgar's men sank to rest, but death was to be the portion of one. Grendel the monster was dead, but Grendel's mother still lived. Furious at the death of her son, she crept to the great hall and made her way in clutched an earl the king's dearest friend and crushed him in his sleep great was the uproar though the terror was less than when grendel came the knights leapt up sword in hand the witch hurried to escape she wanted to get out with her life the aged king felt bitter grief when he heard that his dearest friend was slain he sent for beowulf who like the king had had his own sleeping bower that night the youth stood before Hrothgar, and hoped that all was well. "'Do not ask if things go well,' said the sorrowing king. "'We have fresh grief this morning. My dearest friend and noblest knight is slain. Grendel you yourself destroyed, through the strength given you by God, but another monster has come to avenge his death. I have heard the country folk say that there were two huge fiends to be seen stalking over the moors.' one like a woman, as near as they could make out. The other had the form of a man, but was huger far. It was he they called Grendel. These two haunt a fearful spot, a land of untrodden bogs and windy cliffs. A waterfall plunges into the blackness below, and twisted trees with gnarled roots overhang it. An unearthly fire is seen gleaming there night after night. None can tell the depth of the stream. Even a stag, hunted to death, will face his foes on the bank, rather than plunge into those waters. It is a fearful spot. You are our only hope. Dare you enter this horrible haunt? Quick was Beowulf's answer. Sorrow not, O king. Rouse yourself quickly, and let us track the monster. Each of us must look for death, and he who has the chance should do mighty deeds before it comes. 
I promise you, Grendel's kin shall not escape me, if she hide in the depths of the earth or of the ocean. The king sprang up gladly, and Beowulf and his friends set out. They passed stony banks and narrow gullies, the haunts of goblins. Suddenly they saw a clump of gloomy trees overhanging a dreary pool. A shudder ran through them, for the pool was blood-red. All sat down by the edge of the pool, while the horn sounded a cheerful blast. In the water were monstrous sea-snakes, and on jutting points of land were dragons and strange beasts. They tumbled away full of rage at the sound of the horn. One of Beowulf's men took aim at a monster with his arrow and pierced him through, so that he swam no more. Beowulf was making ready for the fight. He covered his body with armor, lest the fiend should clutch him. On his head was a white helmet, decorated with figures of boars worked in silver. No weapon could hurt it. His sword was a wonderful treasure, with an edge of iron. It had never failed any one who had needed it in battle. "'Be like a father to my men, if I perish,' said Beowulf to Hrothgar, "'and send the rich gifts you have given me to my king. "'He will see that I had good fortune while life lasted. "'Either I will win fame, or death shall take me.' "'He dashed away, plunging headlong into the pool. "'It took nearly the whole day before he reached the bottom, "'and while he was still on his way, the water witch met him.' For a hundred years she had lived in those depths. She made a grab at him and caught him in her talons, but his coat of mail saved him from her loathsome fingers. Still she clutched him tight and bore him in her arms to the bottom of the lake. He had no power to use his weapons, though he had courage enough. Water beasts swam after him and battered him with their tusks. Then he saw that he was in a vast hall, where there was no water, but a strange, unearthly glow of firelight. At once the fight began, but the sword would not fight. It failed its master in his need, for the first time its fame broke down. Away Beowulf threw it in anger, trusting to the strength of his hands. He cared nothing for his own life, for he thought but of honor. He seized the witch by the shoulder and swayed her so that she sank on the pavement. Quickly she recovered and closed in on him. He staggered and fell, worn out. She sat on him and drew her knife to take his life, but his good male coat turned the point. He stood up again, and then truly God helped him, for he saw among the armor on the wall an old sword of huge size, the handiwork of giants. He seized it, and smote with all his might, so that the witch gave up her life. His heart was full of gladness, and light, calm and beautiful as that of the sun, filled the hall. He scanned the vast chamber, and saw Grendel lying there dead. He cut off his head as a trophy for King Hrothgar, whose men the fiend had killed and devoured. Now those men, who were seated on the banks of the pool, watching with Hrothgar, saw that the water was tinged with blood. Then the old men spoke together of the brave Beowulf, saying they feared they would never see him again. The day was waning fast, so they and the king went homeward. Beowulf's men stayed on, sick at heart, gazing at the pool. They longed, but did not expect, to see their lord and master. Under the depths Beowulf was making his way to them. The magic sword melted in his hand like snow in sunshine. Only the hilt remained. So venomous was the fiend that had been slain therewith. He brought nothing more with him than the hilt and Grendel's head. Up he rose through the waters where the furious sea-beast before had chased him. Now not one was to be seen. The depths were purified when the witch lost her life. So he came to land, bravely swimming, bearing his spoils. His men saw him, they thanked God, and ran to free him of his armor. They rejoiced to get sight of him, sound and whole. Now they marched gladly through the highways to the town.
it took four of them to carry grendel's head on they went all fourteen their captain glorious in their midst they entered the great hall startling the king and queen as they sat at meat with the fearful sight of grendel's head beowulf handed the magic hilt to hrothgar who saw that it was the work of giants of old he spake to beowulf while all held their peace praised him for his courage said that he would love him as his son and bade him be a help to mankind remembering not to glory in his own strength for he held it from god and death without more ado might subdue it altogether many many treasures he said must pass from me to you to-morrow but now rest and feast gladly beowulf sat down to the banquet and well he liked the thought of rest when day dawned he bade the king farewell with noble words promising to help him in time of need hrothgar with tears and embraces let him go giving him fresh gifts of hoarded jewels he wept for he loved beowulf well and knew he would never see him any more the coast guard saw the gallant warriors coming bade them welcome and led them to their ship the wind whistled in the sails and a pleasant humming sound was heard as the good ship sped on her way so beowulf returned home having done mighty deeds and gained great honour in due time beowulf himself became king and well he governed the land for fifty years then trouble came a slave fleeing from his master stumbled by an evil chance into the den of a dragon there he saw a dazzling hoard of gold guarded by the dragon for three hundred winters the treasure tempted him and he carried off a tankard of gold to give to his master to make peace with him the dragon had been sleeping now he awoke and sniffed the scent of an enemy along the rock he hunted diligently over the ground he wanted to find the man who had done the mischief in his sleep in his rage he swung around the treasure mound dashing it to it now and again to seek the jewel tankard he found it hard to wait until evening came when he meant to avenge with fire the loss of his treasure presently the sun sank and the dragon had his will he set forth burning all the cheerful homes of men his rage was felt far and wide before dawn he shot back again to his dark home trusting in his mound and in his craft to defend himself now beowulf heard that his own home had been burnt to the ground it was a great grief to him almost making him break out in a rage against providence his breast heaved with anger he meant to rid his country of the plague and to fight the dragon single-handed he would have thought it shame to seek him with a large band he who as a lad had killed grendel and his kin as he armed for the fray many thoughts filled his mind he remembered the days of his youth and manhood i fought many wars in my youth he said and now that i am aged and the keeper of my people i will yet again seek the enemy and do famously he bade his men await him on the mountain side they were to see which of the two would come out alive out of the tussle there the aged king beheld where a rocky archway stood with a stream of fire gushing from it no one could stand there and not be scorched he gave a great shout and the dragon answered with a hot breath of flame beowulf with drawn sword stood well up to his shield when the burning dragon curved like an arch came headlong upon him the shield saved him but little he swung up the sword to smite the horrible monster but its edge did not bite sparks flew around him on every side he saw that the end of his days had come his men crept away to the woods to save their lives one and only one wiglaf by name sped through the smoke and flame to help his lord my lord beowulf he cried with all your might defend life i will support you to the utmost the dragon came on in fury in a trice the flames consumed wiglaf's shield 
but nothing daunted he stepped under the shelter of beowulf's as his own fell in ashes about him the king remembered his strength of old and he smote with his sword with such force that it stuck in the monster's head while splinters flew all around his hand was so strong that as men used to say he broke any sword using it and was none the worse for it now for the third time the dragon rushed upon him and seized him by the neck with his poisonous fangs wiglaf with no thought for himself rushed forward though he was scorched with the flames and smote the dragon lower down than beowulf had done with such effect the sword entered the dragon's body that from that moment the fire began to cease the king recovering his senses drew his knife and ended the monster's life so these two together destroyed the enemy of the people to beowulf that was the greatest moment of his life when he saw his work completed the wound that the dragon had given him began to burn and swell for the poison had entered it he knew that the tale of his days was told as he rested on a stone by the mound he pondered thoughtfully looking on the cunning work of the dwarfs of old the stone arches on their rocky pillars wiglaf with tender care unloosed his helmet and brought him water beowulf discoursing the while now i would gladly have given my armor to my son had god granted me one i have ruled this people fifty years and no king has dared attack them i have held my own with justice and no friend has lost his life through me though i am sick with deadly wounds i have comfort in this now go quickly beloved woodlaf show me the ancient wealth that i have won for my people the gold and brilliant gems that i may then contently give up my life quickly did wiglaf enter the mound at the bidding of his master on every side he saw gold and jewels and choice vases helmets and bracelets and overhead a marvellous banner all golden gleaming with light so that he could scan the surface of the floor and see the curious treasured hoards he filled his lap full of golden cups and platters and also took the brilliant banner he hastened to return with his spoils wondering with pain if he should find his king still alive he bore his treasures to him laid them on the ground and again sprinkled him with water i thank god said the dying king that i have been permitted to win this treasure from my people now they will have all that they need but i cannot be any longer here bid my men make a lofty mound on the headland overlooking the sea and there place my ashes in time to come men shall call it beowulf's barrow it shall tower aloft to guide sailors over the stormy seas the brave king took from his neck his golden collar took his helmet and his coronet and gave them to his true knight wiglaf fate has swept all my kinsmen away said he and now i must follow them that was his last word as his soul departed from his bosom to join the company of the just of all kings in the world he was said his men the gentlest to his knights and the most desirous of honor end of beowulf from a book of famous myths and legends author unknown the country called nonamia from all the way to fairyland fairy stories by evelyn sharp this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the country called nonamia ever so long ago in the wonderful country of nonamia there lived an absent-minded magician it is not usual of course for a magician to be absent-minded but then if it were usual it would not have happened in nonamia nobody knew very much about this particular magician for he lived in his castle in the air and it is not easy to visit anyone who lives in the air 
He did not want to be visited, however. Visitors always meant conversation, and he could not endure conversation. This, by the way, was not surprising, for he was so absent-minded that he always forgot the end of his sentence before he was halfway through the beginning of it. And as for his visitors' remarks, well, if he had had any visitors, he would never have heard their remarks at all. So when some one did call on him one day, and that was when he had been living in his castle in the air for seven hundred and seventy-seven years, and had almost forgotten who he was and why he was there, the magician was so astonished that he could not think of anything to say. "'How did you get here?' he asked at last, for even an absent-minded magician cannot remain altogether silent when he looks out of his castle in the air and sees a princess in a gold and silver frock, with a bright little crown on her head, floating about on a soft white cloud. "'Well, I just came, that's all,' answered the princess, with a particularly friendly smile. "'You see, I have never been able to find my own castle in the air. So when the west wind told me about yours, I asked him to blow me here. May I come in and see what it is like?' "'Certainly not,' said the magician, hastily. "'It is not like anything. And even if it were, I should not let you come in. Don't you know that if you were to enter another person's castle in the air, it would vanish away like a puff of smoke?' "'Oh, dear!' sighed the princess. "'I did so want to know what a real castle in the air was like. "'I wonder if yours is at all like mine.' "'Tell me about yours,' said the magician. "'I may be able to help you find it.' "'Of course, he only said this in order to prevent her from coming inside his own castle. "'At the same time, a little conversation with the friendly princess in a gold and silver gown is not at all unpleasant.' when one has lived in a castle in the air for seven hundred and seventy-seven years. "'My castle in the air is much bigger than yours,' she explained. "'It has ever so many rooms in it, a large room to laugh in, and a small room to cry in.' "'To cry in?' interrupted the magician. "'Why, no one ever thinks of crying in a castle in the air.' "'One never knows,' answered the princess gravely. "'Supposing I were to prick my finger, what should I do if there wasn't a room to cry in? "'Then there is a middling-sized room to be serious in, "'for there is just a chance that I might want to be serious sometimes, "'and it would be as well to have a room, in case.' "'Perhaps it would,' observed the magician, "'who had never listened so attentively to a conversation in the whole of his long life. "'What else will you have in your castle?' "'I shall have lots of nice books that end happily,' answered the princess, "'and they shall be talking books, so that I need not read them to find out what they are about. "'I shall have plenty of happy thoughts in my castle, too, "'and lots of nice dreams piled up in heaps, and where there is just one more thing.' "'What is that?' asked the magician. "'Well, I think I should like to have a prince in my castle.' "'A nice prince, who would not want to be just dull and princely like all the princes I have ever danced with, but a prince who would like my castle exactly as I have built it, and would play with me all day long. That would be something like a prince, wouldn't it?' "'You could not possibly have a prince,' said the magician. "'If you allowed someone else even to look into your castle in the air, it would vanish away like a puff of smoke.' I have lived in my castle for seven hundred and seventy-seven years, and I have never allowed any one to put a foot in it. "'Is it so beautiful, then, your castle in the air?' asked the princess wonderingly. "'I'm sure I don't know,' said the absent-minded magician. "'I don't think I ever noticed. I came to live in it, because it was the only place in which I could be left alone. That reminds me that if you do not go away at once I shall be obliged to become exceedingly angry with you.' "'By all means,' said the princess, who had the most charming manners in the world. "'But I should like to have my castle first. "'I haven't got it here,' said the magician, looking about him vaguely. "'I know I saw it somewhere not long ago, but I can't remember what I did with it. "'However, if you ask the people of Nonamia, they will be able to tell you where it has gone. "'You will find that they are very obliging.' "'Will they not be surprised?' asked the princess. "'Dear me, no.' "'The nonamiacs are never surprised at anything,' said the magician, and he drew in his head from the window. 
the princess in the gold and silver frock sailed away on her cloud and landed presently in the flat green country of nonamia have you seen my castle in the air she asked very politely of the first nonamiac she met what is it like asked the nonamiac without showing the least surprise it is ever so large and ever so beautiful and it is packed full of happiness and there is a nice prince inside answered the princess ah said the nonamiac then it must be the one i saw being blown along by the south wind but there was no prince inside the princess thanked him and hastened away in the direction of the south wind until she met another nonamiac to whom she explained as politely as before what she wanted to know ah said the nonamiac that must be the castle i met just now as it was being carried off by the north wind but i saw no prince inside the princess turned round and hurried after the north wind as fast as she could go as soon as she met another nonamiac however she had to turn round once more for he told her that her castle had just been stolen by the east wind and when she had been walking quite a long time in the direction of the east wind she met yet another nonamiac who told her that it was the west wind who had taken away her castle in the air it is too bad said the little princess sitting down exhausted on a large stone by the side of the road why should all the winds be playing with my castle in the air castles in the air generally go to the winds observed a traveller in a dusty brown cloak who was sitting on another large stone not very far off she was quite sure he had not been there the moment before but in nonamia there was nothing remarkable about that the princess wiped the tears out of her eyes with a small laced handkerchief and looked at the stranger mine is a very particular castle in the air you see she said it is ever so large and ever so beautiful and it is packed with happiness and dreams and perhaps there is a prince in it too a prince said the stranger what sort of prince a nice prince explained the princess who can play games and tell stories and be amusing all the princes i know can do nothing but dance and they are not at all amusing i am afraid though she added sighing that i am going to have my castle without a prince after all would it do asked the traveller in the dusty brown cloak if you were to have a prince without a castle oh no answered the princess decidedly if you knew how beautiful my castle in the air is you would not even ask such a stupid question then she again took up her small lace handkerchief and she brushed the dust from her gold and silver gown and polished up her bright little gold crown and made herself as neat and dainty as a princess should be for in nonamia one never knows what may happen next and it is just as well to be prepared and in fact no sooner was she quite tidy than the west wind came hurrying along with her castle in the air and the princess gave a shout of joy and sprang inside it and the west wind blew and blew and blew until the castle that was packed full of happiness and the little princess in the gold and silver gown were both completely out of sight the traveller looked after them and felt a little forlorn then he picked up his stick and walked on until he came to the magician's castle this may seem a little surprising as he had no wings of any kind and the magician's castle was in the air but it must be remembered that it all happened in nonamia dear dear here's another of them grumbled the magician when he looked out of his window and saw the stranger standing below after being alone for seven hundred and seventy-seven years it was a little exhausting to have two visitors on the same day besides a traveller in a dusty brown cloak is not at all the same thing as a dainty princess in a gold and silver gown good day said the stranger are you the magician who has given a castle in the air to a princess in gold and silver frock with a bright little crown on her head very likely but i cannot say for certain said the absent-minded magician i believe there was something of the kind now you come to mention it but i couldn't tell you what it was however i don't mean to give away any more castles in the air so the sooner you leave me alone the better i don't want a castle in the air laughed the stranger people who spend their lives in building real houses never have time to build castles in the air i want to find the princess not the castle 
"'That you will never do as long as she is happy in it,' said the magician. "'People who live in castles in the air are never to be found, "'unless they have grown tired of living in them.' "'Oh, uh-huh, chuckled the stranger. "'Are you tired of living in yours, then?' The absent-minded magician tried to determine whether he should be angry or not, when the stranger said this, but by the time he had made up his mind to be angry, he had forgotten what there was to be angry about, and while he was thinking about it, the man in the dusty brown cloak walked away and left him. Evidently it was not very long before the princess grew tired of living in her castle in the air, but the very next day, as the traveller was once more resting on the large stone by the side of the road, down she came, castle and all, and stopped just in front of him. Truly, there is no end to the wonderful things that happen in Nonamia. Hello, said the traveller, smiling. What is it like inside your castle? It is not half so nice as I expected to find it, said the princess, popping her head out of the top window. You see, there is no one to play with, and even if your castle is the most beautiful castle in the world, it is always dull when there is no one to play with, isn't it? I don't know, answered the stranger. I have never had any one to play with. What else is wrong with your castle? Well, continued the princess, it is all very well to have a castle that is packed with happiness, but when it is packed so tight that you cannot get it out without some one to help you, it is not much good, is it? I don't know, answered the stranger. My happiness has never been packed so tight as all that. Have you anything else to complain of? A great many things, said the princess. It is all that stupid magician's fault. When I said a small room to cry in, I didn't really mean a room to cry in, did I? But every way I turn there is always the room to cry in, staring me in the face. I am sure there is something seriously wrong with my castle in the air. No doubt about it, said the traveller, and it is clearly the magician's fault. When you came to live in your castle in the air, continued the princess, plaintively, did you find that it was very different from the one you had built? The traveller in the dusty brown cloak burst out laughing. I have no time to build castles in the air, he said. I build real houses for other people to live in. People who would, perhaps, have no houses at all if it did not build them. That is more important than building castles in the air for oneself. "'What are your real houses like?' asked the princess. "'They are strong,' answered the stranger proudly. "'All the four winds joined together could not blow them down. No one has ever built such strong houses as mine.' "'Are they beautiful, too?' asked the princess. I have no time to look after that, answered the stranger. I build more houses than anyone else in the world, and still there are people who are waiting for houses to live in. I must build as fast as I can, day after day, year after year. Then why are you not building houses now? asked the princess. The great builder looked sorrowful. There is something wrong about my real houses, too, he confessed. The people who live in them are never quite contented, and I have come away to think out a new plan by myself, so that the next houses I build shall be the most wonderful houses in the world. The princess leaned her chin on her hand, and looked quite thoughtful for a moment or two. "'May I come and help you to build real houses for a change?' she said presently. "'I am dreadfully tired of building castles in the air that do not turn out properly, though, of course, that was principally the magician's fault.' Still, if you were to show me the way, I might be able to build something real that would turn out properly, and that would be ever so much more amusing. It is not at all amusing, said the traveller, shaking his head. You would soon grow tired of it. Besides, you would have no prince to play with. I don't think I want a prince to play with, said the charming princess in the gold and silver frock. He might turn out to be as dull as my castle in the air especially if the magician had anything to do with it. I would much sooner come and help you to build real houses. The traveller in the dusty brown cloak still shook his head. Little ladies in gold and silver gowns can only build castles in the air, he said. Do the people who live in your houses never build castles in the air? asked the princess. I never thought of asking them, answered the great builder. I have been too much occupied in building their real houses. 
"'Then let us go and ask them now,' said the princess, and she came down from her castle in the air, and stepped once more on to the dusty road, and held out her little white hand to the traveller. Her castle in the air vanished like a puff of smoke the moment she stepped out of it. "'What would be the use of that?' asked the traveller, smiling. He took the little white hand, however, for no one could have refused that much to such a very charming princess. Why, said the princess in the gold and silver frock, then we could make their real houses just like their castles in the air, and only think how packed with happiness they would be. The traveller looked at her in amazement. It was certainly astonishing that so great a builder as he should find out what was wrong with his houses from a princess with a bright little crown on her head, who had never done anything but build castles in the air. Still, we must remember that it all happened in Nonamia, and that accounts for a great deal. "'You are quite right,' said the traveller. "'You know far more about it than I do. You shall come and help me to build real houses, and they shall be the most wonderful houses that have ever been built. "'All beautiful to look at, and packed with happiness inside,' cried the dainty little princess, clapping her hands for joy. "'And we won't let that stupid magician spoil our real houses, will we?' The magician was looking out of his window at nothing at all, when they came past his castle, hand in hand. "'We are going to build the most wonderful houses in the world,' cried the princess. "'Ever so much more wonderful than the stupid castle in the air you gave me.' This was not very gracious of her, for, after all, the magician had given her exactly what she had built for herself. However, as he had already forgotten both of them, and could not think of anything to say, and, as they were in too great a hurry to stay and help him, there is nothing more to be said about the magician, except that he is still living in his castle in the air, and looking out of his window at nothing at all, which is a right and proper occupation for a magician who is absent-minded. As for the traveller and the charming princess, they spent the rest of their days in building the most wonderful houses in the world for the people who had nowhere to live and as for the people who had nowhere to live it was only natural that they should all find their way to the country called nonamia where a little lady in a gold and silver gown taught them to build a castle in the air and a great builder in a dusty brown cloak made it into a real house that was packed with happiness it is a little difficult to believe that this is all true but then it must be remembered that it all happened in nonamia ever so long ago. End of The Country Called Nonamia by Evelyn Sharp Read by Pam Castile